Once upon a time, there were no out queer characters in children's books, programs, movies, or magazines. Times have changed. Joining us now to find out how kids' media portray 2S LGBTQ plus folks, we're joined by... On the shores of the Detroit River in Amherstburg, Ontario, Cara Brisson Boyvin, Director of Research for Media Smarts. And in Waterloo, Ontario, J. Andrew Deman, Professor in the English Department at the University of Waterloo and St. Jerome's University, whose research explores representation in comics. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Cara, I'm going to start with you. I'm hoping you can sort of set the landscape here and, and maybe give us an evaluation. How are we doing when it comes to queer representation and youth-oriented media here in Canada? Well, I think we've come a long way and we have things to be proud of, but we still have a ways to go. You know, we have, in many ways, Canada is seen as a global leader in its representation of LGBTQ plus communities. We have the examples of Schitt's Creek, where the main character mm -hmm. is pansexual and he describes his sexuality as liking the wine and not the label. We have the Canadian series, sort of, where the main character there is non-binary. And that show is really setting the bar in terms of intersectional representation you know that character is a queer south asian muslim um you know we have legislation that protects you know uh, representation in the media industry but the canadian radio television commission has uh, lately undergone a review of its diversity and representation in cancon and has found that fewer than half of canadians feel that they are accurately or meaningfully represented in the canadian media landscape so we are definitely still dealing with challenges of underrepresentation. We are definitely still dealing with issues of stereotyping where LGBTQ plus characters are relegated to niche roles or really represented in narrow ways. And we're also dealing with the challenge of othering where you know particular aspects of a character like their sexuality are overemphasized in a way that sort of doubles down on difference. Andrew, I want to get your take in there. I see a lot of head nodding, so a lot of agreeance <laughs> there. But I imagine, uh, you know, if you can give us sort of a grade or, or how we're doing when it comes to uh, queer representation, what would you say? Um, I, I agree with a lot of what was said. I, I think there's certain sectors where you're seeing more growth than others. I, I think the Canadian graphic novel market, the North American graphic novel market are really good examples of that. Um, where there is a little bit more um, emphasis on representing queer characters and telling queer stories. Um, so I, I think it's not universal. It's not an entirely level playing field. It's sort of fits and surges here and there. All right, Andrew, I want to follow up with you. Historically and more recently, how much does fiction actually impact reality? And when I talk about that, the social impact. Yeah, this is the million dollar question in the arts. Um, I think most people like to believe that the arrow points both ways. Uh, that the worlds that we portray in our media affect our reality and our um, worlds that we portray in our media should um, also impact our reality um, in a meaningful way. Uh, I think when it comes to queer representation, you, you've got a little bit of an imbalance where the world that we're seeing in our media doesn't reflect the reality that we live. And that can compound the problem where you have a lot of people who are feeling underrepresented um, and even beyond that, you're, you're encountering people who feel like they don't know how to interact with people who are queer because they don't see them portrayed in the media at all. So it's sort of um, impacting everybody um, in a way. Uh, I think ideally the goal uh, from any arts perspective would be to have a world that is very similar and proportional uh, in fiction to reality. And we're not seeing that yet. Kara, it sounds like an obvious question here, but what are the benefits, and Andrew had sort of highlighted some of those, uh, when we talk about expanding queer representation in youth-oriented media? Well, I think one of the beautiful, sort of powerful pieces of, of all forms of media is that it provides audiences, but especially young audiences, with either a window opportunity or a mirror opportunity. A mirror opportunity is when you're seeing yourself represented on the screen or in the form of media. And a window opportunity is when you're being exposed to another kind of identity or experience that you might not normally in your everyday life. And so, you know, representation is incredibly powerful. You know, for marginalized groups, seeing themselves accurately represented is incredibly powerful, it has been linked to, you know, uh, increased academic achievement, self-esteem. Um, and similarly, seeing accurate representations of groups like the queer community has been linked to, you know, a reduction in prejudice. So again, the power of representation mm -hmm. really can't be understated.
Andrew, you, you talked about sort of the a little bit of the socialization um, aspect as well. Um, th that these portrayals can have a socializing influence on children's development. Um, what does that mean? Um, we, we tend to frame it as in modern media scholars in terms of the construction of the self, um, which is understanding who you are and valuing yourself within the world. Um, and that can be, uh, I don't know, a, a very kind of personal thing about, you know, um, self-identification, but it can also be a health thing. Um, we know, for example, that queer youth and trans youth are extremely susceptible to a lot of very real physical maladies compared to the general population. Um, we're talking about increased re rates of um, depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation. Um, so there are um, very real quantitative outcomes that are coming out of this. So if you have representation that can intervene, as many scholars have suggested it can in your construction of the self and reduce some of that anxiety, reduce some of that depression, um, you can literally impact the health and well-being of youth on a massive scale um, without sending them to the doctor. Do you have any examples uh, of media showing those uh, interventions what, um, that come to mind? That come to mind, um, well, okay, so scholarly example, um, Catherine Bond Stockton, who is the author of The Queer Child, which is still considered um, maybe the most landmark text on how uh, media portrayals of, of queer children impact that concept of the self. Um, she talks a lot about how the silences surrounding queerness can only be broken in fictional media. Uh, because we, we need that fantasy construction first, and that then creates pathways for things like acceptance, uh, um, things like identification. Um, in terms of um, the actual, like, like people talking about the results, one of the great examples, and, and again, my expertise is in comics, um, you have all these creators, really famous Eisner Award-winning creators, talking about why they put queer characters into their books. Uh, and they keep saying this weirdly consistent thing that... Um, I wrote this book because this is the book I needed when I was a teenager, uh, that this book was you know, designed to save my life, essentially. Um, and and I, I think the, the reiteration of that statement is powerful in itself from people who've been through that and lived that experience. Um, and we also have other examples of journalists. Um, May Root has talked about this, how um, the, the book Lumberjanes was, again, the book she needed when she was a teenager, when she lived through thoughts of suicidal ideation every single day. Um, just for being who she was and seeing how she was not integrated into her society. So seeing fictional worlds where characters are integrated into society. And the example of Schitt's Creek is a, is a great one, too. Um, I, I think that can be really important to someone's general well-being. Again, not just mentally, but medically as well. Kara, we want to talk about authentic representation. That is something that I think a lot of people have talked about in the past when we talk about characters as well when we uh, in media. I'm hoping you can give us a little peek behind the curtain when we talk about uh, behind the, the media industry, the media sector, that might be contributing to the lack of um, authentic representation. Yeah, I, I think, you know, underrepresentation behind the scenes generally typically translates into underrepresentation or misrepresentation on the screen. You know, since the 1960s, feminists have been saying it matters who makes media. And who makes media today is still typically straight white men. And so, you know, it, it, we're not necessarily going to see better representation, or perhaps it is not surprising why we're struggling with some of the problems we are struggling with, until the people behind the scenes in, you know, director and producer and you know, making corporate decisions are also represented of a variety of different, you know, communities, including, and most importantly, marginalized communities. All right, I want to bring up an example, um, a, a recent example. Uh, Disney's Buzz Lightyear movie uh, was banned at, or restricted in 14 countries where it was showing a scene of same-sex characters kissing, um, and it may be seen as immoral in, in, those, in those countries. Do we see some of those sentiments here in Ontario? Uh, I'll start with Kara. Yeah, I mean, I think regardless of whether we're seeing the specific examples in Ontario, because of the network world that we're living in, we all have access mm. to these sort of global stories at our fingertips. And our children are listening and are cognizant of the things that adults discuss as being controversial. So it is incredibly important to have conversations with our children at, an, at a young age, as young as possible, about things like stereotypes and representation. Media Smarts has lots of helpful tip sheets and tools for parents and guardians and educators to talk to young children about stereotypes and representation. We also have a whole sort of suite of resources that help parents seek out positive portrayals 
um, some of the ones that Andrew was you know, mentioning for their for their children. Um, in fact, we have a partnership with TVO Kids where we've done these wacky media songs. One of them is called You Do You, and it's all about pushing back against stereotypes for children. All right, I want to follow up with that, Andrew. Um, what are some of the reasons why portraying LGBTQ plus characters in youth oriented media, but also I find sometimes in adult media to be so contentious? I have sat in rooms mm. with people who have said that they have seen stuff on screen and they've questioned why does there need to be so much representation? As someone who's in the queer community, I sort of scratch my, my head, I bite my tongue. <laughs> but, you know, why is it so contentious when we talk about youth oriented media? I think we're in a cultural landscape where we, we have a lot of competing belief structures, um, different ideologies, different politics, obviously different religion, different educational standards. Um, as a result of that, you, you've got sort of um, um, queer children caught in this, this horrible tug of war uh, and they're being pushed in every different direction. And I think that just adds to the sense of confusion. I think we need to be respectful of everybody's beliefs, but I mean, the best way that we can kind of work through those issues is through open dialogue, not through erasure, symbolic annihilation, which historically has never gone well. Um, I'm assuming Kara would agree with me on that, just in terms of the broader media sentiment. Uh, Kara, you know, I think it's important when we when we talk about sort of um, LGBTQ um, youth oriented media, we can't ignore what's happening south of the border where, you know, there is that bill that's been dubbed that is now law that says don't say gay, which is, you know, really preventing the conversation around sexual orientation and identity uh, between kids uh, from kindergarten to up to grade three. And I'm curious, I just want to pick up on the point. Why is it so contentious? Well, I, I would echo some of what, you know, has already been said, but emphasize that I think it's important for us to, you know, pause here and reflect on the fact that these portrayals are contentious, perhaps to a few adults, but not necessarily to young people. And, you know, young children, even under, especially under the age of nine, don't typically question whether what they're seeing on the screen is reflective of reality unless they're prompted by an adult. So really making it incredibly important to have these conversations with younger youth. But as youth age up, you know, they move into their older tweens and teens, they become far more aware of representation issues and will actively seek out better representative material. And so again, I think they're, they're only contentious insofar as it's in some cases, adults projecting what we believe to be contentious mm. onto young people. And also that they're contentious because they are challenging structural inequities. They are challenging portrayals of what we uh, believe to be, you know, or have, you know, come to accept as the norm in this case, you know, heterosexuality. So, and young people are often at, you know, at the forefront and sometimes much further ahead than adults in terms <laughs> of being willing and open to embrace you know, difference. We don't give kids uh, much credit, I don't think, uh, but yes. Um, I want to talk about uh, stereotypes, um, and I want to uh, pull up uh, uh, some, some data that was done through a focus group. The Black Screen Office conducted focus groups and one-on-one -on -one interviews about representation in media with over 400 Canadians for the Being Seen report, which was published in February 2022. In the 2S LGBTQI a plus communities report, the researchers identified several problematic reoccurring stereotypes associated with queer characters in media. They include the gay best friend, the villain, gay white males as the sole example of queer representation, 2S LGBTQIA plus people only being seen through the lens of trauma, inaccurate portrayals such as queer characters being promiscuous, and lack of intersectionality. Uh, I'll, I'll bring Andrew in here. What are some of the challenges that remain when it comes to portraying queer characters, particularly in media geared towards younger audiences? Yeah, I, I think there are some specific challenges um, um, that, that come out of like um, the broader institutions of society and how we literally raise children. Uh, I mean, we've heard the expression, it takes a village to raise a child. Um, Kat Lay, who's the author of Snapdragon, um, points out that um, a lot of queer children are not raised in queer families. Uh, as a result of that, they don't really get the kind of role modeling that they need. Um, and there's a spectrum there up to and including being absolutely rejected by their parents for being queer. Um, so the idea that, that comes up a lot in queer communities is the concept of found family. 
uh, of you know um, um, making your own family structure and, and learning how to do role modeling and all that kind of internally and maybe taking on some of the aspects that we usually associate with the institution of parenthood. Um, so th that's a very interesting kind of variation because you've got one institution failing and the other picking up the slack. And I think media can play a role in that. Um, and a lot of queer youth talk about that as well. Um, seeing themselves in media and understanding themselves in media in a way that, that even their family can't um, really talk to them about or, or, or help them out with. Uh, so I, I think there are certain particulars, let's say, um, with regard to um, growing up queer that, that make it very important for us to have, I don't know, I don't want, I don't want to call it like a media safety net uh, in place in order to pick up some of the slack um, when the traditional institutions just maybe even not even for lack of trying, um, really don't have the ability to um, um, provide the supports that the children need. Kara, uh, I'm hoping you can pick up on that when we talk about challenges that remain when it comes to portraying queer characters. Yeah, and I, I think um, I would echo that, but also reflecting on what you pulled up on the screen and what we were seeing there in, in terms of those stereotypes. Again, that is in part because the industry remains very risk averse when it comes to diversity and inclusion. And you know, is typically, you know, creating content, especially when it's original content for, you know, white, cisgendered, straight audiences. And um, so we had to keep that in mind. I think the other thing when it comes to challenges that remain, um, we've been talking about it, is that um, you know, queerness has is not yet represented in the media landscape as a fact of life, as just sort of existing because it exists. Um, and so that's also a big challenge, you know, echoing some of what Andrew said around um, allowing youth to see themselves meaningfully and accurately uh, represented and reflected, but also that, you know, youth need to see a variety of identities and experiences and stories so that, yes, marginalized communities and issues um, and challenges are reflected, but also so that they can simply be because they exist and they are a fact, you know, that is a fact of life. And we have we certainly haven't reached that point yet. All right, I want to bring up a point um, that Andrew had made uh, earlier in the program when we talk about um, access and, and interacting with healthcare. Um, could expanding queer represent representation lead to changes in how uh, younger people interact with healthcare and social services? You touched on it a little bit, but I'm hoping we can expand on that. Yeah, I think so. So um, my research came from um, a development at my university, St. Jerome's, where we're um, launching pending final approval next fall, a health humanities program, which is all about the interactions and intersections of health and humanities, which of course includes media. Uh, so understanding how, I don't know, uh, things like, say, um, trans people might be reluctant to seek out healthcare for fear of being stigmatized. Um, again, that's a place where a media can intervene and uh, again, you know, um, spread the word that trans people exist and are viable as human beings uh, in the most basic sense, right? Um, that can be important. Again, lowering depression rates, anxiety rates, suicide rates. Um, those are major health interventions. Uh, we, we live in a country that has socialized health care. You're, you're talking about saving the taxpayer a whole lot of money uh, in that process. If our media can play a part in our overall approach to human health, that's amazing. That, that's a breakthrough. I want to pick up on the point you said, spread the word. Uh, and a, a question for both of you, I'll start with, uh, with Kara. Um, what can audiences do? Um, in their role as consumers uh, to advance queer representation? Well, I think one thing that's really interesting to, to focus on, and we haven't really talked about it too much, is, is the role of the digital sort of world. And, you know, we're talking mm. about the networked media environment we're living in, so things like streaming services, video sharing services, and those kinds of services, you know, that are providing content to us that is algorithmically dr driven, um, they are very much, you know, delivered and centered on things like watch time and engagement. And in that regard, audiences have quite a powerful role to play. Um, you know, digital content um, that is largely driven by either watch time or engagement, um, you know, is is going to be to a good degree impacted by how much time we watch or engage with things. But I say this because I think it really emphasizes the importance of digital media literacy, because first and foremost, audiences need to be aware of those kinds of 
um, factors that I was speaking to that will influence how we're given and our content is delivered to us, but also the power they have in influencing that. So, you know, unless we are aware that, um, you know, the amount of time we're watching content or whether we like, you know, something in, in a social platform or on YouTube will impact how often audiences are seeing it, you know, audiences are less likely to actually um, engage in that in that power or utilize that that power. And I think the last thing I would say as far as digital media literacy and youth is really emphasizing for young people, not just that their voice matters and that they have a, you know, a place to play in the landscape and that their stories and experiences ought to be heard, but emphasizing for young people that all media has social and political implications. And even when it appears not to, that is typically because it is reinforcing how we already see the world. Andrew, we'll pick up on that in terms of uh, what audiences can do um, as as roles as their role as consumers. Yeah, I, I really like what Kara is saying. I, I think it's it's all about having conversations with your children. It's about um, participating in their media, uh, which which can be painful as a parent sometimes, but it's good to watch what they're watching uh, and have conversations with them about it. Um, and then specifically to um, the subject of queer youth. Um, the digital world can actually be very empowering in terms of creating a level of safety and security by which they can seek out uh, media portrayals. Um, whereas, you know, in the old days, maybe you don't want to go to the video store uh, and rent something that would be looked at as specifically queer for fear of being, um, I don't know, identified within your society. Um, online spaces can offer, in as much as people view online spaces as being kind of predatory and dangerous, and those, those dangers are real, um, it can also be very empowering queer youth, allowing them to find representation that they might otherwise be um, unable to access. I do want, uh, we have a couple of minutes uh, left in, in, in the program, and I, I do want to possibly scroll back a little bit. Um, and it is a question for our audience, for, for people who are tuning in who may not know um, what 2S LGBTQIA stands for. I was wondering, Kara, can you hop in there and, and, and sort of give us a, a breakdown a little bit on sort of what that, act that acronym actually means? Sure. I mean, so 2S is referring to two-spirited, you know, and an LGBT, that lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, uh, intersex, non-binary uh, <laughs> community, and, and plus, because there are all sort of uh, identities along what some people call a spectrum. Um, but I think, uh, you know, and, and there's also a contentious uh, contention within the community about queerness, because for a long time, that term was seen as being quite derogatory, but younger, typically younger members of the of that community have sort of um, re-embraced that term and 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 um, are using it in a sort of activist or, or way to restory what it means to be queer. Um, but yeah, I think you know at at the end of the day, like that community is a diverse community. We need to keep in mind that there are like if any other community challenges uh, and and differences. Um, and I think one of the beauties of the acronym is that it is an attempt to um, capture the difference within the community. All right. I don't want to put you on the spot for both of you, but I'm curious for members of that community, their allies and consumers uh, of youth oriented media. Andrew, is there any recommendation uh, for any sort of uh, media literature or anything that you would suggest uh, to the audience? Yeah, I, well, as I said, I'm, I, again, I'm coming from the comics perspective, mm -hmm. and there's some great work being done right now. Uh, I strongly recommend Lumberjanes, which is a TV or a comic book series um, that has recently finished. HBO Max is making a cartoon out of it. It's all about different relationships to gender, different relationships to sexuality, um, integrated into a broader universe with really fleshed out characters. It's amazing. Um, yeah, so if, if you want sort of a nice thing to kind of um, check out, step your foot in the water situation. Um, I, I think Lumberjanes is perfect. It's a great book to read with your kids. Awesome. And then, uh, Kara, get the last word. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, in terms of, I would say, like, shows to watch, maybe we talked about Shit's Creek. If you're probably living under a rock in Canada, if you haven't seen it or <laughs> heard about it. But, you know, that's a great one. I mentioned sort of. The other one that I was actually uh, just made aware of this morning was a show on CBC, it's particularly for tweens and teens, called Heartstopper, which really is centering a uh, gay love story. So it has been held up to uh, sort of some high standards around uh, uh, a, an example of LGBTQ plus representation that is um, empowering a lot of young people. So I'd recommend Heartstopper as well. Really great stuff. Kara, Andrew, thank you so much for your insight and your perspective. Thank you for joining us on the program tonight. 
Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.